so I have an honest question, and I would like us to give the answer some honest thought. How much empathy can a writer show without readers making assumptions about that writer's sexuality? Feel free to file that question away in temporary storage while I use the androgynous sounds of my voice to share with you a few words about Shakespeare, sonnets, and sexuality. Back in my sophomore year of high school, I read the collected sonnets of William Shakespeare for the first and second time in my life, and I hated them. This was in part due to my being 16 years old and overestimating my comprehension of Middle English. Because believe it or not, hey ho means something different to a 16 year old. Would you accept sophomoric humor? However, in 16 year old me's defense, each sonnet was too short for a meaningful plot, with about 400% more melodrama and 5% of the wittiness I had come to expect from the Shakespeare plays, even the tragedies. In other words, the sonnets had all of the arcane Elizabethan lingo of Romeo and Juliet with none of the fun. But alas, there was no escaping these sonnets, for in my junior year of high school, our long-suffering lit teacher taught 17-year-old me and her peers how to write sonnets using those of Shakespeare as a guide. And it turns out, an understanding of these sonnets is a seriously useful thing to have for all sorts of poetry applications. The exactness of syllables in their allotted spaces make them an easy, predictable read even for the most nervous of public speakers. They acquaint young people with organization and math as tools for structuring a given verse. Each sonnet is 14 lines long, 10 syllables across, and has a rhyme scheme that looks like this, with occasional commas to suggest where pauses go, kind of like a Sudoku puzzle of the written word. Of course, in high school, I did not appreciate the 10 syllable per line rule, and either we were not told that this phenomenon was called iambic pentameter, or we were told and my attention span has always been this good. But at some point between then and now, I have grown fond of iambic pentameter, in that, once you know how to say one poem in that rhythm, you theoretically know how to say them all. Like, knowing how to rattle off, Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Has made it easier for me to appreciate poets like Dorothy Parker. Why is it no one has sent me yet? One perfect limousine, do you suppose? And harder to appreciate poets like Edgar Allan Poe. Nicely played, Mr. Poe. You broke the rules beyond all recognition, called the results a sonnet, and people believed you because you're Edgar Allan Farrakhan Poe. Anyway, while my personal feelings have softened toward the sonnets over the years, I still think they're a far cry from Shakespeare's greatest work. But were Mr. Shakespeare here, I think he might agree with me. See, according to Lee Jameson at ThoughtCo.com, the world's most famous sonnet collection was not published by the author, or even with the author's permission. It was just sort of an unwieldy bunch of one-off works that Mr. Shakespeare scattered amongst his colleagues before an enterprising fellow named Thomas Thorpe smelled money and compiled the sonnets in an unauthorized collection. A plausible origin story that would be consistent with what appear to be unfinished entries in the collection, as well as some of the more creatively spelled words. And unfortunately, Mr. Thomas Thorpe's obnoxious publishing tricks were not the worst fate to befall these sonnets in their existence. In 1640, a publisher named John Benson revised the sonnets, 126 of which reflected a man's love for another man, and changed the pronouns from he to she. That um, makes the pronoun argument only slightly younger than the King James Bible, folks. Incidentally, 1640 was the same year Oliver Cromwell went to Parliament to start warming England up to the notion that a joyless puritanical dictatorship, in which Christmas and Halloween were hashtag cancelled, was a pretty neat idea. So while Mr. Benson, the pronoun changer in question, could have been unscrupulously amending poetry that did not agree with his worldview, he may have just as easily been looking around at the people getting killed for whatever the religion du jour considered an abomination that week, and honestly asked himself, is censored Shakespeare truly worse than no Shakespeare? Fortunately, in 1780, the enemies of literary censorship ruled in favor of the original recipe sonnets, changed the pronouns back, and have kept them basically untouched ever since. So, does all of that potentially make the sonnets Shakespeare's gayest work? Not necessarily. They are certainly not as well remembered as Twelfth Night or Merchant of Venice for their challenges to long-standing gender norms. And as thick with meaning as the sonnets may be, the place would probably have them beat for gayness and other themes if for no other reason by the sheer volume of each work. Also, as the folks at ThoughtCo put it, the nature of the relationship between the two men of the sonnets is highly ambiguous, and it is often impossible to tell if Shakespeare is describing platonic love or erotic love. An opinion that is, incidentally, shared by Greg Maupin over at Kentucky Shakespeare, to whom I reached out for a comment in preparation for this video, and who wrote to me of the venerable old bard thusly. 
the case for the gayness of these sonnets has definitely been made. But the gayest? I go with Twelfth Night for that. But we know almost nothing about Shakespeare's biography. And what with the human brain requiring a narrative, we love to fill in the blanks. Were they deeply personal? Commissioned? Somehow leaked for money? In character? We are unlikely to know. I think it is fair to say that Shakespeare's own empathy was so vast, it's difficult to tell what was personal to him and what was an attempt to wear the shoes of others. At some point, I guess we'll have to let it be enough that he wrote a set of poems about human emotion and romantic love in a way that still connects to an implausibly large percentage of people, no matter their own romantic specifics. So, love being love, they're all over the spectrum, as they ought to be. Therefore, while it's not wrong to be curious about Shakespeare's gender, sexuality, or what have you, I'm not sure anyone who distrusts Shakespeare on the suspicion he might have been gay would trust him any further if he was proven to be, or not to be, a raging Milton-esque sex machine around women, just as it wouldn't make diehard fans of Shakespeare love him any less. But what oh what does it say about our culture if we see a writer wielding empathy well enough to make us feel things, and our first thought is, if empathetic, then gay? Is it because women and the gays are the only ones who supposedly feel big emotions other than anger? Is it because we find it less emotionally challenging to look at a writer who makes us ask hard questions of ourselves and go, well, you would say that that's because you're gay. That lot weren't lovely and more temperate. So, all of that said, the sonnets might neither be as gay as a daisy nor the place to get a comprehensive understanding of Shakespeare as a writer. But if you are just getting your mind around iambic pentameter, the sonnets are bite-sized chunks of Elizabethan literature that influence a lot of poetry that came after them. And the purposeful gaining of a better understanding toward Shakespeare is one of many straightforward ways to irritate an uptight bigot near you. As always, thank you for giving these videos a shot. If you too suffered through the sonnets in high school and would like the opportunity for revenge, there's a book for that now. Until we meet again, take it easy. Loves you. Bye.